take one. Oh, I'm not holding back, George. I'm giving my all. Oh! By the power invested in me by Her Royal Majesty, I declare this fate well and truly open. I can take you back via the magic meteor of song. One, two, three, five! Well, she was just 17, did you know what I mean? And the way she looked was way beyond compare. So how could I dance with another? Oh, and I saw her standing there. I'd been up to the cavern and I'd seen what they could do. I knew their repertoire, I knew what they were able to perform. And they weren't great, but there was something about them that was worth investigating. I personally loved George Martin because no one else really wanted to put us on the label. And George Martin said yes. He had a very great musical knowledge and background. I mean, he taught us a lot, and I'm sure we taught him a lot by our sort of primitive musical ability. I think George quite liked the way we had about us. I'm not sure, he, I don't think he was that convinced about our musical ability just then. I think he felt we were kind of raw and rough, but there was had some quality that was interesting. Yeah. I think they were very nice people, but I didn't know they could write any decent songs, you know. Love Me Do is the best one they were able to offer. We'd played Love Me Do on stage a bit and it felt quite good and uh, we wanted to do that. We made a record of it and got to number 17. Love, love me do You know I love you I'll always be true So please Love me do the best thing was it came to the charts in two days and everybody thought it was a fiddle because our managers' stores send in these, what is it, record things. Return. Returns. And everybody down south thought, ah, oh, ha, ha, he's buying them himself or he's just filling the charts, you know. But he wasn't. Love me do. And they hadn't much experience of recording studios then. They learned pretty quickly. They brought along a song. My main role would be telling them what to do with it. This needs to be, say, two and a half or two and three quarter minutes long. OK, I'll time the chorus, see how many choruses you need. And they were all thinking in terms of singles. George Martin says, well, have you got anything you'd like to do? We said, uh, we've got a song called Please Please Me. This is one John had uh, just written. Here we go. You're right. Get this bloody little mic out of the way. <clears throat> Don't be nervous, John. Don't I'm be not. Nervous. Don't be nervous. Take it, Evan. Last night I said these words to my girl. I know you never even tried. At the end of that session, I was able to say to them, you got your first number one. We've thought about it, and probably the thing that John and I will do uh, will be write songs as we have been doing, as a sort of sideline now. We'll probably develop that a bit more, we hope. Because the singles had started to sort of look good, we warranted an album. And I said, let's record every song you got. Come down to the studios, and we'll just whistle through them in a day. We'd all say, well, what about this, what about this? Because basically this album was just what we did live in the clubs. We had to just run them down so they could get some sort of sound on each one. And then we just did it. Ringo, can you give us any more? Yeah, as loud as you want. The last song to be done was a song called Twist and Shout, which nearly killed me. John had to save Twist and Shout till the last. And he was 
sucking zoobs all day. Those little throat tablets. And he finally had to do Twist and Shout, knowing he had to do it last because it would just rip his throat apart to do it. It was great. You can still hear that on the record. Come on, baby. This is it, a piece of plastic. I mean, a piece of plastic was like gold. You know, you'd sell your soul. You would sell your soul to get on a little record. And that was the first album. That's it, that's a master. Da, 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 dun, dun, da. It was later on that they blossomed as songwriters, from me to you onwards. I remember being very pleased with the middle eight because it was a sort of strange chord in it. And I got arms and lungs, oh, it sort of goes to a minor, and we thought that was that was a very big step. I got arms and long to hold you and keep you by my side. I got lips that long to kiss you and keep you satisfied. From me to you was really important because that kind of put the stamp on it. Because remember, everybody would try to do in those days, make a single that sounded just like the one that was the hit. And we kind of avoided that, but if you notice, it did have the harmonica still on it. All we did was to record singles, and the ones that weren't too good, we wouldn't issue as singles, we put them on an album, which is what with the Beatles was. We weren't thinking in terms of an album being an entity by itself. It was a collection of their songs, and I think one or two other people's songs as well. It's about the nearest we could get to, knowing what we sounded like before we became the clever Beatles. Close your eyes and I'll kiss you Tomorrow I'll miss you We'd be well into the album, and uh, we all knew that you know, I'd be doing a number somewhere. So we'd either say, have you got a song, you know, we've got this for you. I want to be your lover, baby. I want to be your man. I want to be your lover, baby. I want to be your man. 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 In those early days, it was primarily the American rhythm and blues sound that was their inspiration. I think this is probably what the so-called Beatles sound was, because all the black music was a tremendous influence on them. I joined the Beatles, we didn't really know each other, but the four of us virtually had the same records. I had the Chuck Berry record and I liked it, and I used to sing it on the club. There was a bunch of cover versions, Mr. Postman. It was very difficult in 1963 to think they were going to last forever, and I would be talking about them years later. We'd never heard of anything in rock and roll lasting more than a couple of years, so we thought we were about the same. People demand that you think, how long are you going to last? Well, you can't say, you know. You can be big-headed and say, yeah, we're going to last 10 years, but as soon as you've said that, you think, you know, we're lucky if we last three months, you know. Well, obviously, we can't keep playing the same sort of music until we're about 40, because no, when we're sort of old men playing from me to you, nobody's going to want to know it's all about that sort of thing. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. She loves you, yeah, 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 yeah. 
She Loves You. We had this idea, it was, it was very, very much a pop idea. Of she, we reported conversation, that she said she loves you, that we were merely the messenger. So say it, she said she loves you, and you know that can't be bad. Yes, she loves you, and you know you should. Just on this roll, and we were all in our early 20s, and we were just going with it. We drive from Liverpool to London, run into the BBC Playhouse, set up our stuff, do a quick run through, then go on the radio live, grab a cup of tea, jump back in the van, drive to Newcastle, do a gig, and then drive back to Liverpool, like all in the same day. When we go home, you know, we go in early in the morning when we finish the job, and the kids, you know, they don't know you at home, but if they find out, well, where I live, they get the drums out, you know, and beat it out. I mean, we don't know, it may be next week, it may be two or three years, but I think we'll be in the business, either up there or down there, for at least another four years. But we didn't realise what was to come. Tune in next week, folks, for 64, 65 and 66. <laughs> It was 1964 before we had a number one in America, which was I Want to Hold Your Hand. It wasn't designed specifically for the American market, but like the ones before it, it was a great record. Let me be your man. They didn't really get totally immersed in record production until later on. There wasn't time. They would dash into the studio, put down their tracks, and they'd leave all the work really to us. They were incredibly busy during those first years. If you look at our itinerary, we did uh, maybe a tour of England, a tour of Europe, a tour of America, two albums, about four EPs and three singles, and made a movie all in the same year. One, two, three, four. It's been a hard day's night, and I've been working like a dog. It's been a hard day's night, I should be sleeping like a lot. We knew that in rock and roll you could get in a film, so we wanted to be in a film, if at all possible, but we wanted to make a good one. I give her all my love, that's all I do. And if you saw my love, you'd love her too. I love her. Hard Days Night was the first big one I did. I had the benefit of having a director who was a musician, Dick Lester, who was quite a good pianist. And of course, we recorded the special songs for the film as, as we would just do ordinary recordings. And Dick used a lot of the songs I'd already recorded. You know, the past albums, Can't Buy Me Love, already have been recorded, for example. Take two. Uh, I'm giving up the business. Come on, George. Come on, we're doing it. We're on. George is tuned up. I've George just... is tuning up. Two. Can't buy me love. No. Can't buy me love. I'll buy you a diamond ring, my friend, if it makes you feel all right. I'll get you anything, my friend, if it makes you feel all right. Because I don't care too much for money, but money can buy me love. 